Um, one of the things that happens when you grow up in church like I did is that when you grow up in church world and you kind of become familiar with everything, you kind of know the answers, um, you kind of know the stories, you start to think strange things. Okay, so, I mean, maybe this isn't so strange, but I actually wonder from time to time, why is it that John 3.16 became such a big deal? Like, there are many, many scriptures in the Bible that show the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 that I've quoted to you before says, I want to remind you of the gospel. It is of first importance. And then he begins to explain that Jesus Christ, um, uh, it's a quote in Greek. I can't quote it. It's gone away. But um, uh, give me a minute. <laughs> it was there. But uh, <laughs> what did you say? Okay, it's okay. Um, it says, uh, you know, I want to remind you of the gospel, and it says that you know Jesus Christ, he, he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was raised from the dead according to those same scriptures. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So why is it that John 3.16 became a thing and Romans 5.8 did not? You know, why did you never have anybody at a football game with a sign that says Romans 5.8, even though that's a really, really clear picture of the gospel? So I got to wonder about things like that. I understand why... You know, some scriptures are more important or, or stronger than others. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a true kind of uh, funny story. Um, years ago, when I was a children's camp director, we were doing a camp that was, um, and Dan is already laughing, we were doing a camp that had an Olympic theme to it. So it must have been like 1990, I don't know, six. Um, but uh, we were doing this camp with an Olympic theme, and uh, so we had camp t-shirts. The camp t-shirt was supposed to be the verse, um, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's a, that's a meaty verse, right? That's a powerful, like, charge the hill kind of verse. And that's what was supposed to be on the shirts. I accidentally put um, Philippians 3.3 on there instead of 3.13. So for an entire summer, about 100 children are running around with a shirt that actually the verse is, for we are the circumcision. <laughs> so if anybody cares to actually look that up, <laughs> they were really confused. Really confused. So I understand why sometimes some verses are chosen over others, but other times it's like, I just don't get it. But Psalm 23, Psalm 23 is what we're going to look at this morning. And Psalm 23, I think I know exactly why it's the favorite. And it's because it is absolutely universal. It's because Psalm 23 is kind of this journey. It's this, uh, it's a picture of pilgrimage. It's a picture of moving from one place to another. And what Psalms 23 is, is little signposts. And now, my road's different than yours. I've got different problems than you do. I've got different hills to climb than you do. I've had different difficulties. But we all share these signposts in common. They're all very common to us. And so, just for a few minutes this morning, we're going to just run through Psalm 23. And um, I just want to remind you of... Because we all have these things in common, because all of these things in Psalm 23 are going to happen to us at one time or another, I just want to remind you who God is at that time, in those times, right? So it's as simple as that. So it starts with um, an assumption. It starts with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. It starts with the Lord, nothing else. Nobody else. I can't rely on anything else to guide my life. It starts with the Lord, and it starts with a personal relationship is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
It was so funny to me. When I was a kid and beginning to learn scripture and beginning to memorize scripture, I, I read that wrong. I looked at it as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I asked my dad, why don't I want God? Why don't I want the shepherd? I didn't understand Cindy Collins. But it's the Lord is my shepherd, I don't want. I have no need. And it goes on from there. Here's the first signpost. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. In every person's life, whether you know Jesus or don't, because frankly, the kinds of things I'm about to describe are things that happen to everyone a bajillion times in your life, but we only notice a fraction of them. But everything in our lives, there are, there are moments that are just beautiful. They're just restful, right? They're, they're, they're green pastures, they're still waters, they're, they're soul-restoring moments. So, and Scripture would have you know that every good gift is actually from Him. It's actually from God. So just real quick, because i got to get you involved somehow, other than laughing at me for being an idiot about um, <laughs> Philippians 3. But i got to get you involved somehow. Just real quickly, just remind yourselves, each other, of, of some of those kinds of moments uh, where you just, you just knew that just, just beautiful, wonderful things that have happened in your life. What are some really good things that have happened in your life? Go for it. Got to yell it. You, your three daughters. Beautiful, wonderful time. Nobody, what? Yeah, absolutely. What did he say? He said shelter, a place to live, just be a home. What? Be homeless and pay rent. All right. Keep me out save time. Awesome. The beauty of nature. The beauty of nature? I mean, you can just sit and see it. No. That's what I did this morning. I took advantage of the beautiful morning. I went outside on the deck and I just sat. Watched the birds, listened to nothing because the neighbor's air conditioning wasn't going yet. <laughs> you know, it's just, just nice. So, I mean, we can keep going, but there's just these these moments where you just you just know that it's just peace. It's just rest. It's just beautiful. The birth of our kids, the, the relationships, the friendships, it's just that kind of time where you just know that it's a good, wonderful time of life. Good memories. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths of righteousness implies that there is a path of unrighteousness. This is just a reminder that every day we have choices to make. Every day we have this thing in front of us that's, you know, you can either go the path of righteousness or you can go your own way. Every day we make that decision. The path of righteousness is not always easy. And in fact, the path of righteousness often leads to the valley. So it says, He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I've said this many times, I think I probably wasted a lot of time in messages trying to explain rods and staffs and shepherds and sheep and things that I knew nothing about and missed the bigger picture, the bigger point, and it is that every time you walk through a valley, there is comfort. you got to look for it. You may have to find it. But every time you walk through a valley, there is comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is the hardest one. Because like I said, we're, we're talking about the commonality that we all experience. We all experience good memories. We all experience good, beautiful things. We all experience that moment of decision of, you know, am I going to go the right way or am I going to go this way? Um, we all experience difficulties and challenges and valleys and things like that. But this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my, my enemies. I've read lots and lots of commentaries and stuff. It could be one of two things, but I think both things have one thing in common. So let me just explain that briefly. Um, it could be that this is kind of a taunt. 
It could be that what this is picturing is I'm in, uh, eating the spoils of victory in the presence of my enemies. Meaning they're watching because they're already defeated. Right? So it could be that they're in the room that they're starving while I eat. It could also be that they are outside that they are present, that in the middle of the uncertainty and the middle of the mess, I'm still eating. I'm still in the presence of my Savior. I'm still in the presence of my rescuer. And so either way, that's the commonality. The commonality is in the middle of whatever it is that I'm going through, he's there. You've anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. These are the moments when you are aware of the deep richness of God's blessing in your life. These are the moments where you just are aware of a future and a hope and a promise. Okay? And then here's the best one. And I probably ran through those others way too fast. But this is the best one. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, we look at that, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and we just immediately, like, jump to, well, that's heaven. That's, you know, and it is, okay? So, but, but don't jump there yet. Because it says, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. And then I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So here's the good news. The good news is that right now, whatever signpost you're standing next to, if you're standing next to the signpost that is, you know, life couldn't get any better, and it's just beautiful, and it's wonderful, and everything is coming up roses, and it's just perfect, and everything worked out, and the bills are paid, and whatever else, you know, you don't have a hard time understanding that maybe you do, but God's with you. That's pretty easy. But I'm telling you, if you're standing at a point where you just don't quite know what to do, and you're really drawn toward what you should do, but you know that this is the right path, God's goodness and God's mercy is chasing you down right there. If you're standing in the middle of a valley, if you have no idea what's going to come next, if you're scared, if it's a valley, if it's a shadow, if it's death itself, the goodness and the mercy of God is chasing you down right there. If you're standing in the presence of your enemies and you don't know who's going to win this particular battle, the goodness and mercy of God is chasing you down right there. See, this is the good news of this psalm, is that wherever you are, whatever you are doing, wherever you are standing in, um, His goodness, His loving kindness is chasing you down. That means that when you're convicted of wrong, His goodness and His mercy is chasing you down. That means when you are uncertain about things, His goodness and His mercy is chasing you down. Every time we fall, right on top of us is His mercy and His love, bringing conviction and repentance and comfort and victory. So all those signposts, they're common to us. But there are other things that are common to us as well. And so this psalm reminds us that God's mercy and God's loving kindness is chasing us no matter what is going on in our lives. And, and we will dwell in the house of Lord forever. Because that's what that is. When we dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that's not the icing on the cake. That's not just the end game. It's the culmination of having walked with Him and having been chased down by Him time after time after time after time. See, in our lives, there's going to be thousands of blessings. There's going to be millions of decisions. There's going to be hundreds, dozens, I don't know how many, there's going to be lots and lots of valleys. There's going to be lots and lots of times where you're not sure about the enemy and what's going on there, whether or not there is victory. But I'm telling you, this is the promise. 
And this is what eternity will be. It will be God's grace and goodness and love and acceptance and forgiveness wrapped around us. Because it has chased us for so long. Now, really quickly before we come to um, Lord's Supper, I just want to ask you the four questions that we've been trying to use to get us to the gospel. You know Psalm 23. I probably didn't even need time to take I probably didn't even need to take time to explain it. You know it. Most of you probably already have it memorized. So let me just ask you. Is it up there? The whole thing? Oh, just the questions. Okay. Let me just ask you. When you look at Psalm 23, who is God? And what has he done specifically as it relates to Jesus? Got to talk back to him. He's providing peace. Redemption of mercy is chasing after you because of Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so he's providing peace. But how do we know that? I mean, how do we know that God's providing peace? Because, I mean, because it says so, that's one answer. But, I mean, okay, it's in you. How did, just, how did Jesus provide peace? How does Jesus provide peace? He paid the sacrifice, the penalty for our sins, so we're, we have peace with God the Father. We're no longer under his judgment, so therefore we have peace as we face our future, and we have peace as we look at our sin and know we don't measure up. There's peace because the debt is paid. Because the debt is paid, she said. I don't know if you could hear everything that she's saying. But um, be, be louder. Turn around. Be louder. I'm not going to be able to repeat it the way you just did. So. I don't know that I can repeat it. Well, go for it. <laughs> I said we have peace with God the Father because our debt has been paid. He paid. Jesus paid. Our debt paid the penalty of our sin. So when we look at our sin and we know we don't measure up, we can be at peace. Because we know that we're not going to face that judgment. That God demands, and yeah. I may have said something else. <laughs> That's good. Who else is he in that song? What else has he done, especially in Christ? What else has he done? I guess he, I mean, to go along with that, like he's made the way for us to come into relationship with this great, he's his shepherd in it, you know, so he leads us, but without, like it's just saying, you know, like without what he's done, like we couldn't couldn't be in fellowship with God. He's brought us back to him. Um, so he's provided all that. Um, so he's saying that uh, Jesus is the one that made the way for us. He blazed the trail for us. You know, the, the, the wonderful part about that, of, uh, of the path of righteousness, is that yes, each day we have an opportunity. We've got choices to make. But um, he walked it perfectly and then credits that perfection to our account when we put our faith in him. So he walked that path of righteousness. It's great. Erica again. Okay, side thought. Side thought. Yep. I like that even better than any other explanation I've heard. Because he's the mediator, um, and because he makes, you know, you, you think about in the New Testament, you've got uh, Matthew, who is a tax collector, uh, a lackey, if you will, a flunky of the Roman government, 
Um, and you've got Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, who was a uh, zealot. So he's a terrorist against the Roman government. And you've got Matthew, and they're running around together. The only way you can do that is if Jesus brings them together. You've got other examples in the New Testament, in the Corinthian church, for example, of people that, you know, are radically different from one another, but brought together because of the commonality of Christ. I really like that. I never thought about that. This is why we talk. <laughs> this is why we... I, I was challenged all over again by uh, one of Scott's favorite passages uh, this week. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 where everyone comes with a prophecy um, and a, a, a word of knowledge or whatever. Yeah, it, it's, it's this passage in uh, 1 Corinthians, I think it's 14, right? Um, <laughs> this is a test. Um, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 14 where it talks about how the church comes together and each one has a prophecy. And I got to thinking, wow, that, that means that sometime during the week, because they pretty much only went, I mean, they met once a week, but they also met outside of, of, of the gathering. They met in private homes, and, and of course, being uh, a smaller community, they were just kind of closer, and they rubbed elbows more than we do, because we're scattered to the, you know, Peoria and Quad Cities and wherever else. But it, it said that, you know, whenever they came together, that each one had a prophecy, or each one had a word. And I got to thinking, wow, that means like during the week, they were preparing themselves for this gathering. So that everyone had something that they were like, you know, bursting at the seams to talk about how God was working in their lives at that moment. That's just really challenging to me because a lot of people just kind of, oh, wait, it's Sunday, I gotta go to church. And they don't eat, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah. So, okay, that's who is God? What's He done? Last questions are who are we and what are we to do based on that new identity? And we're already kind of there, um, but we're talking about the idea that, you know, we're at peace. Therefore, with God, therefore we can be at peace. Um, we are the, the, the lamb in this uh, song. We're the ones that is being guided. We're, you know, um, so that's kind of part of the answers. But to talk back again, who are we and what are we to do? I mean, Psalm 23, it's all lovely and we can slap it on a refrigerator and we can quote it. But who are we and what are we to do with it? Because it's true. Whereas children, so we and we have the good news, so we can tell others. That that, by the way, is good news. If if you've been uh, a Christian for 116 years, or if you don't know Jesus from anything, the good news is that God's mercy and God's loving kindness is chasing you right now. Doesn't matter what's going on; He is on top of you. This, pardon. Go out and be the ministry. Be the church. Kind of the, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah. Scott? Oh, you're just like, you testify. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I love it. Hey, I hope you don't mind. Okay, I mean, it's not like I didn't prepare. It's, it's not like I, you know, when we do this, it's not because I'm like, oh, shoot, I got nothing. I got to count on these people. It's not that at all. It's really that, um, it, it really goes back to that idea of this is the weirdest church when we are, um, that didn't sound right. I can explain, just listen, this is the weirdest church when we are living according to the, the vision that God gave this church in the beginning. This is a weird church because you have one really, really part-time pastor and how many ever of, of you there are full-time ministers of the gospel? And you have a full-time minister of the gospel here. So I guess I'm, you know, time and a half or something. Yeah. But I mean, the thing is, is that when we are, are, are living the way that God intended this church to live, 
We are the church. And so um, we cannot be the church where you all pay the pastor to do the work. We have to be the church where the pastor and the elders and leadership equip the church to do the ministry, which is what we're supposed to be doing in every church because that's Ephesians 4. And so this is that. This is that equipping. This is what we're challenging to do with your own children and, and uh, you know, those questions to, to, to get your, your family toward um, this, this uh, understanding of who God is, what He's done, and therefore it changes us. And we're new, different people. And we live different lives. So I, I hope you don't mind this sort of interaction back and forth every once in a while. I don't do it every week. Um, especially not as much as we've done this morning. Um, but I just, I just feel the need every once in a while to just kind of, kind of pull on you a little bit. Uh, to, to, to grab from you the wisdom that I know is there and that you, I already know are sharing with one another and all that. We just need to you know, share it with one another. So here's the thing as we come to what's up. Um, the, the central image that I was working with, um, because it just, it, uh, it, it's what jumped out at me this time as I was studying uh, Psalm 23, is that image of surely the loving kindness and the mercy and the goodness of God will follow me all the days of my life. I love that. Just love that. I, it, it's a weird image, but I just have this picture of God's love, God's mercy as an animal chasing me down and kind of attacking me and kind of throwing me on the ground and, and just smothering me, not in a bad, violent way, but in this wonderful, I don't know, I just, I, I just have this image. Make it fluffy bunnies. I, I, whatever it is um, that, that locks that in for you, um, that's what this is. When we come to this table, when we come to this bread that represents the body of our Savior, when we come to this drink that represents the blood of our Rescuer, you know, there, there, there's no greater example it's, it's Romans 5.8. God demonstrated His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while I'm failing, while I'm falling short, while I'm messed up, while I don't know which way to go, while I'm being pulled in the wrong direction, while all of that is going on, Christ died for me. That is the loving kindness. That is the mercy. That is the goodness of God chasing me. So, Father God, I just thank you that uh, 